All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll pray for us. Father, I pray you help us today. Uh, I pray that you help us understand your word in a better way than we've ever understood it before. I pray that we would come to love you and to believe uh, your promises and your word and your written word in a way that would make uh, Christ glorious in the world. We pray all these things for his sake. In his name, amen. So we're going to look at a psalm um, today, Psalm 22. And uh, I want to just read through this psalm. I'll pull up the classroom Bible here. Um, this is a famous psalm. You may recognize that uh, Jesus quoted uh, this psalm um, as he was dying on the cross in most of the gospel accounts it's the major thing that uh, Jesus says um, I'll just get this set up so we can see it uh, together and so uh, this is what the Psalm says, and I'll try to uh, translate it as literally as you can, follow along uh, here. It says something like, for the boss, uh, on the doe of the dawn, a melody belonging to David. My God, my God, why have you uh, forsaken me? Far from my salvation are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry out to you by day and you do not answer at night and there is no peaceful silence for me but you are holy and having the praise of Israel in you our fathers trusted they trusted and you delivered them to you they cried out and were delivered in you they trusted and were not put to shame but I am a worm and not a man the reproach of mankind and despised by the people, all who look at me mock me. They open their mouth, they wag their head. Uh, let him uh, roll onto Yahweh. Let, let him trust in Yahweh. He will deliver him. He'll do. Uh, he will rescue him since he delights in him, quote unquote. But you are the one. You are the midwife who took me from. Uh, my mother's womb. You are the one who made me trust on the breast of my mother. Upon you I was cast from the womb. From the belly of my mother, you are my God. Don't be far from me because distress is near, because there is no one who helps. Bulls surround me, great bulls surround me. Uh, strong bulls of Bashan him me in, or it could be crown me, uh, depends on how you uh, point it. Uh, they open their mouths on me, a lion roaring and ripping like water I'm poured out. I can count all my bones, all, all my bones are out of joint. My heart melts within me like wax in the midst of my insides uh, my uh, my uh, mouth is dry and the tongue my st tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth you keep pouring me out in the dust of death because dogs surround me a, a congregation of evildoers him me in like a lion my hands and feet and you can see the English here is they pierced my hands and feet. This is like a lion, my hands and feet. I count uh, all my bones. Um, they look at me. Uh, they stare at me. They divide my garments. Um, on my clothing, they cast a lot. But you, O Yahweh, do not be far away. My help to... Bring me aid, hasten. 
deliver my soul from the sword, from the hand of the dog, my precious thing. Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the horns of the wild ox. And then it changes in Hebrew and says, you answered me. Like in mid-sentence, it changes. I will recount your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. O fears of Yahweh, praise him, all the seed of Jacob. Uh, give him honor. Tremble before him like a foreigner, all you seed of Israel. Because he did not despise, he did not repudiate the affliction of an afflicted one. Nor did he hide his face from him. But when he cried out to him, he heard. From with you is my praise in the congregation, great congregation. My vows I will repay before those who fear him. They will eat. Uh, the afflicted will eat and they will be satisfied. They will praise Yahweh, those who seek him. May their heart singular, live forever. They will remember, they will return to Yahweh, the, all the ends of the earth. They will worship before you uh, all the um, families of the Gentiles because the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules among the nations. They will eat and they will worship all the fat ones of the land before him they will cower, those who go down in the dust and whose soul is not alive. But a seed will serve him. It will re be recounted to the Lord for a generation. They will come, they will tell of his righteousness to a people yet to be born because he has done it. Now what do you find interesting about that psalm and why do you think Jesus quoted that on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the psalm, it's uh, talking about David's anguish and feeling like he's been abandoned by God after all these trials are heaped upon him. Um, when Jesus was dying on the cross, he was separated from God because he took all of humanity sin upon him and God cannot be in fellowship with sin. And so in order for um, Jesus' the sacrifice to be made complete, he had to be you know, the fall for humankind. Yeah, I mean that that's amazing. He's he's quoting this, he's feeling that, he's feeling the separation. What else do you find interesting? Did anything appear strange to you when I read the psalm? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this person, like halfway through the psalm, God vindicates them, and it's like it's going to lead to this massive conversion of all the people of the world, and even dead people are going to have things happen. That seems strange. Um, did you pick up on it when I read it in Hebrew that it doesn't say pierced hands and feet and the English does say pierced hands and feet? What? That seems pretty interesting, doesn't it? Did it say like a lion? Like a lion. So what's going on there is called a textual variant. Um, and I want to show you the issue and I think you're going to like this. So this is Psalm 22 in the New Testament, uh, Jesus' last words, ancient text in biblical theology. The ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken 
me. Uh, the, what we have in Psalm 22 is this quote, um, but then we have this verse in English, dogs encompass me, a, fa- a company of evil doers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. And what we have there are two different ideas. One is piercing, ESV. The other is they maul my hands and feet like a pack of dogs. So the issue between those two readings is this. So uh, what this is, this little bit here on the end of, you know, Hebrew is read from this way to this way. So this little bit, um, if, if this is the reading, then this is a verb and it means they blank. If this is the reading, then this is the word like, and this is the word lion. Now, tell me, what are, what's the difference between those two readings? The difference between those two readings is the length of one letter. So, you've got Aleph, Bey, Gimel, Dalit, Hey, Bob. Zion, Tet, Tet, Yud, uh, Kop, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samek, Ayan, Hay, Sadi, Kov, Reis, Sinshin, Tav. So do you recognize that this letter? In this letter, that the only difference between the two is this one has a doesn't have a tail and this one does. So that's the difference between those readings. Pierced is going to be the long one, and like a lion is going to be the short one. So this is called a textual variant. You have two ancient manuscripts, and they read different things, and we as readers want to know which one is right. So what can we do? I mean, you could say, look, this was written 3,500 years ago. You're trying to figure out, does the thing have a tail on it or not? 3,500 years, it, that's impossible to do. Impossible to find that out. Well, let's see. Let's see what we can do. So the manuscript that I read from in Hebrew is this manuscript. So this is manuscript B19A. It's in Lenin. It's called the Leningrad Codex. Uh, Leningrad was what St. Petersburg was named when the communists ruled uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, it's kept there. I think it's in the Hermitage, which is kind of like the Russian Louvre. And that manuscript was copied in 1008 AD. The guy who wrote it signed his name. He um, put his name. He put the date. We know what year it was copied. We know who did it. And there's no question that that, well, you tell me. What does that uh, read? So this is the actual manuscript. And um, that's a long letter, and that's a short letter. That's a, that's the long letter, and that's the short letter. So which one does that one read? Does it read like a lion, or does it read they pierced? It reads the, uh, like a lion, and you can tell because the writer is kind of putting a little curve. And see these long ones, even though the the length is not not that much difference. It's clear that the long ones are a full downstroke. So this has to say, the only thing it can say is like a line. So manuscript B19A, 
which all printed Hebrew Bibles are just reprints of B19A. B19A does not read pierced. It reads like a lion. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I had the privilege of going to um, Jerusalem, and there's a, a manuscript called the Aleppo Codex. It was uh, copied in 930 A.D. Um, 1008 is B19A. The Aleppo Codex is 930. I was just walking around the dome, uh, the shrine of the book. I was minding my own business. I came up to a book, and lo and behold, it's the Aleppo Codex. The Aleppo Codex was sitting right there underneath glass, and I looked down, and it was opened to a place, I think it was open to like Psalm 35, and so if it had just been a couple of pages over, oh my goodness, and I wanted to see, what does Aleppo read? The problem is that the Aleppo Codex uh, is not a complete manuscript. It was kept in Aleppo, Syria, where there were riots. And when there were riots, people would run in and rip pages out uh, and keep them. Every now and then, a family will send the, a page back that, that's been in their family for 100 years, and they have plagued consciences but somebody tore out the page that has Psalm 15.1 to Psalm 25.1. So we don't know what the Aleppo Codex read. A lot of people think B19A was actually copied from the Aleppo Codex, but we won't know because somebody ripped it out. Uh, whenever you're doing uh, textual criticism, you want to go to the oldest manuscripts. And if you go to the oldest manuscripts and, you know, you start with B19A and then you go to Aleppo, well, the next one you can go to is the Psalm Targum. So it dates between the 7th and 9th century. And it has what's called a double translation. Um, a lot of times in ancient translations, if somebody comes across something and they don't know how to translate it, they'll translate it two different ways and let you decide, and they call that a double translation. So one way he translates it is biting how just like a lion. And I think what he's doing is reading this as a participle, biters of, He's reading it as a verb, or he says you could read like a lion, but either one of those, is that the long letter or the short letter? Both of them are short. So this is not looking that great for, um, you know, they pierced my hands and feet. But let's keep going back. So if we went back further, eventually we would come to a place called the Cairo Geniza. So this is a synagogue in Cairo, Egypt. And uh, have you ever been a part of a church and you like have a building project? Uh, you know, you have like a building and then you decide to put a family wing or a new sanctuary or something? Well, when that happens, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times they'll block up a, a closet or something and, you know, build a new hallway or sh shut a, Door. Well, they did that in this place. And there was a guy there in the Cairo Geniza whose job was to copy manuscripts. And when you copy a manuscript, it's kind of like an American flag. Uh, you're supposed to burn the one you copy. So you, you copy it and then you burn the old ones because you don't want it to be disgraced. Well, somebody in the Cairo synagogue was a hoarder. And instead of burning the copies, he kept them. And he kept them in a closet, a closet that was bricked up when they built a new wing. And if you've been in a church long enough, you know, sometimes they'll tear, tear down or build a new thing. And so they did that, and they found a whole closet full of manuscripts. And this is what they found, the Cairo Geniza. 
one Hebrew manuscript after another that had just been piled in a closet and had sat there for hundreds of years. And this guy, I think his name is Solomon Schechter, I'm not sure, he actually went through all of them and found out what they were and what they quoted. And lo and behold, the Cairo Geniza reads, well, you tell me, long or short? Short, like a lion. So this is 6th century. This is not looking good. 10th century uh, or 11th century, uh, 10th century, 7th century, 6th century, all read like a lion. When we come to uh, Jerome's um, translation into Latin, Jerome reads, they have bound. And so, uh, do you recall that our word was, was this? So, Jerome reads that. What do you find interesting about that? Is he reading like a lion? No, he's reading a verb. He thinks it's, they bound my hands together. Uh, do you know who Jerome is? Have any of you ever been to a Catholic church? You know how the Bible in a Catholic church in Latin is called the Vulgate? Okay, he's the guy who translated the Vulgate. He did it in Bethlehem. There's a cave that since like 100 AD, people have been revering where uh, it was where Jesus, where the stable was in this cave. And um, they built a huge church over it now. And if you go... They've got a little bitty door in the church. You've got to bend, bend down to get in it, but you can go in and uh, you go to the front and there's this little cave. You go down in there and it says Jesus was born here. Well, Jerome, and it's in Bethlehem, uh, Jerome moved to Bethlehem and he translated the Vulgate in that cave. And after he had been there five years, he learned Hebrew. And so after he translated the Vulgate, he did a translation of the Psalms called Eux de Hebraeus, according to the Hebrews. And he said that this is what was in his manuscript. So he was actually reading Hebrew, and he said, this is what was in my manuscript. Now that's fourth century, so now we've got a real issue. Is it like a lion, or is it they blanked? His word, if if the word is is this, if that was in a manuscript, it could it could come from this verb. He dug through. It could come through purchased. He gave a feast, or he bound. This is what Jerome thinks it's from. But it could be from this. They dug through my hands and feet. We don't know. Let's keep looking. When he did the Vulgate, he translated, they dug through my hands and feet. So he's reading the same word. He's just thinking it comes from a different root. The Old Latin has, they dug through my hands and feet. Same thing. Now this is interesting because Aquila was a guy who, for a little while, had converted to Christianity. Uh, so for a little while, he was a Christian, or claimed to be Christian. And then he decided he didn't want to be a Christian, so he became an apostate. And he wanted to turn as many people from Christianity as he possibly could. And so he made the argument that the Septuagint, Christianity only depended on the Septuagint, and if you 
really read the Hebrew, it wouldn't you wouldn't be Christian. And so what he did is a translation where he was trying to turn people away from being a Christian. And this is what he translated it as. They disfigured my hands and feet. Now, what do you find interesting about that? He says it's a verb. So he says this is how you should read it. And here's the difference between this and that. This is, and this is, oh, you didn't hear it. Let me do it again. This is, and this is, oh, you, you didn't hear that? So this is, if you take your throat and what, can you barely hear that? And this is like a less version of that. What do you find interesting that he's got this? He's trying to turn people away from Christianity. He says this is what was written. What do you find interesting about that? I find interesting that he doesn't say the reading was what? Like a lion. He doesn't say that. He admits that the reading was a, a what? A verb. This is a hostile witness who admits that the reading isn't like a lion. It's some verb. Well, he didn't like his first translation, so uh, his first translation is, they disfigured my hands and feet. So I tried a second one. And he went with Jerome's reading, they bound my hands and feet. What do you find interesting about that? What I find interesting is even his second reading admits that it's a verb. He's from the 3rd century. So 10th, 11th century, like a lion. 10th century, like a lion. 7th century, like a lion. Cairo, Geniza, like a lion. Jerome, they blanked. Aquila, they blanked. So, again, he, he's reading it from this root. Symmachus is another uh, reviser uh, of the Septuagint. And for the life of me, I don't know what he's reading. As if seeking to bind, it could be that. My hunch is he's probably reading that. I doubt he was reading that. So what would Symmachus support, long or short? P probably short. Theodosian, we don't know what he read. Uh, it's missing. When you get to the Peshitta, the Peshitta is written in Aramaic. Syriac, which is a version of Aramaic. And when Jesus is on the cross, do you know that he spoke Aramaic? So that when he quotes the psalm, Eloi, Eloi, Lema Sabachthani, he's actually quoting Aramaic there. It's not Hebrew. It's the language that had replaced Hebrew. So the Peshitta is a translation into that Aramaic dialect. And it took place somewhere between 100 and 300. But it clearly reads, they pierced. So it doesn't read like a lion. It reads the verb, they pierced, my hands and feet. So now we've got 11th century, but the farther back we go, the more witnesses we're getting to a verb. And remember, we're trying to figure out the length of one letter in a manuscript that was 3,500 years old. So we're just trying to find all the evidence we can. And then we come to the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were written before Jesus. 4Q88 has they dug through. The exact reading that Jerome had the exact reading 
that Aquila settled on. This is a thousand years older than B19A. So this is a Dead Sea Scroll. Whenever you have a number in the Dead Sea Scroll, the Q stands for Qumran. So all Q manuscripts are Qumran manuscripts. The four number tells you what cave it was. So if it's 1Q Isaiah A, it was found in the first cave at Qumran. If it's 4Q, it was found in the fourth cave. If it's 11Q, it's found in the 11th cave. And then the number is the number of manuscripts that they brought out of that cave that this one is. So this was the 88th manuscript that they brought out of the cave. So what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, I'm glad you asked. The Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, it was a cult. Um, it was a male-only cult. They hated women. Uh, they couldn't stand women. Women were like the dirtiest thing in the world. They went out in the middle of the desert to live together as men. Now, right off the bat, that seems a little weird to me, but cults are weird. They were weird. It was an end-of-the-world cult, so it was like if they were today, it would be people who couldn't stop talking about anything but revelation. You know, the world's going to end just, you know, and they even had this book about the battle line, and they were going to throw their spears, and then they were going to do this, and then God was going to kill the Romans. And they were weird. They were a weird cult. When you came, you had to give all your money. And there's a, a scroll called the Copper Scroll. And it's a list of all the money that this cult had. And the odd thing is, nobody's ever found it. So hidden out there somewhere is this huge, fantastic uh, uh, wealth, and it's written on the copper scroll, which would be like writing it on million-dollar paper uh, today. And so they're living out there. Um, they had all kinds of harsh discipline rules. Uh, you could only talk when the people who had been there longer than you allowed you to talk. Weird, weird, weird. But they had books. All cults always have lots of Bibles and lots of cult stuff. Bibles and cult stuff. And Dead Sea Scrolls have Bibles and cult stuff. Well, in 70 AD, they must have uh, marched out to fight the Romans, and it didn't quite turn out the way they hoped. They were slaughtered. They were all of them slaughtered. But before they left, there must have been a doubter, because in this little cave out in the middle of nowhere, he put all his books. And they went out, marched against the Romans, and were slaughtered. And so what happened to all those books? They just sat there for 10 years, for 100 years, for 1,000 years, for 2,000 years. Until one day there were two little boys who had lost a sheep. And they saw a little hole there. This, this part's been made bigger, and this part's been dug out, but originally it was just this little hole. And they thought somehow their sheep might have climbed down and gotten in that hole. And so they stood right here, and they started throwing rocks, and they thought if our sheep's in there, we don't want to go home because Dad will beat us if we don't have the sheep. So let's see if the sheep... I don't want to crawl down there unless the sheep's down there. So let's throw rocks. And one of the little boys threw a rock, and it just perfectly went through that hole. And when it went through, a sound of like 50 plates crashing happened. And the two little boys said, there's something interesting in that hole. And so they go over here, and they climb, and they climb in and they find the library. They find 1Q Isaiah A, the oldest Bible manuscript on the face of the earth. It was in a um, 
jar and it had been sealed on the top. And so they carried it out and they carried it to their dad. And they said, we can't find the sheep, but we found this. And the guy's like having a heart attack, you know. So he takes it to an antiquities dealer. Now, just to put this in perspective, in uh, before World War II, the British people paid one million dollar, one million pounds. Pound was worth like a lot of money. Uh, even today, it's worth like two dollars, but then it was worth a lot of money. They paid a million pounds for Codex Sinaiticus. So this Arab man took the one Q Isaiah A to an antiquities dealer. And the antiquity stealer says, great, I'll give you, how much money do you think you offered? Yeah, it, it was $5,000. So, I mean, it was a lot of, but I mean, the thing, this is the oldest Bible manuscript in the world. And what do you think the nomad did with the 5000 He took it. And so now the antiquity dealer has the oldest manuscript in the world. What do you think happened after that to all the little caves everywhere in the desert? Every little Bedouin climbed up in every single one, and that's how we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. So lots of cult documents, and if you ever have a problem sleeping at night, get an English uh, translation and read through the cult things and it'll put you out like that. Uh, it's weird. This was weird group of people, but they had Bibles and they copied Bibles. Now, one of the caves <coughs> at Qumran is called uh, Caves 5 and 6, Nahal Hever. And this is a picture of Nahal Hever. And one of the caves is here. And one of the caves is here. One is called the Cave of the Books. And the other is called the Cave of Death. So what happened? Well, in 70 AD, people hightailed it back and they crawled down and they got in these caves. And the Roman army came here. And what do you do if you're the Roman army? Well, you could try to send four or five people down there and fight. But what's going to happen? You crawl down in this cave and you fight to try to get into the cave. What's going to happen? They're going to defend and it's going to be lots of people going to die. Ah, ah, you know, over and over. But you're a smart Roman commander. What do you decide to do? Burn them out or let starve them out? And they chose starve them out. And so the people ate all the food they had, all the water they had, and then what happened? They starved to death and died. After a long time, they crawled into caves. Everybody's dead. How ticked off are you as a Roman person? You've been out here in the middle of the desert for a month starving these people out of this cave. You pretty ticked off? They were ticked off. So they got in the cave of bodies in the cave of books, and what, what do you think they did? They defiled everything they could. They cut books up and did things, but... They left them there. They left in 100 years past, 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000. What do you think happened when that antiquity stealer paid 5,000? Oh, there's a cave here. Oh, that's going to box, box, box. And so we have it. What does... The, what's the reading? I mean, you tell me. So you're looking at the same manuscript that every single person is looking at. What's the reading? It's
it's they pierced my hands and feet. So tell me what happened. How did we get? Uh, if we go to the Septuagint, uh, it's they dug through, reading what Aquila and Jerome did. So help me. What happened? What did somebody do? Remember, you copy the manuscript, you burn the original. What did somebody do? You're a Jewish person and you're trying to get people not to be Christians. And they say, but Psalm 22 says they pierced my hands and feet. And you've got a scroll that said they pierced my hands and feet. What is it very tempting to do? Uh, my text doesn't read pierce my hands and feet. And they almost got away with it, right? Because if you're burning the ones you copy, then you copy it, and then you burn the original. Now you've got a Hebrew scroll, and it doesn't say. You've altered one letter, but you've altered it from they pierce to like a lion. But did you get away with it? Because you didn't know there was this little weirdo cult out in the middle of nowhere that hated women. You know, you knew the translations were reading pierced or some kind of verb, but you didn't have Hebrew text. But God, in his infinite wisdom, saw to it that you and I would have enough evidence where even the length of one letter we can decide what the original reading is. And it isn't like a line, it's pierced. And we know it's pierced because we have the Dead Sea Scrolls and all, the farther back you go, the more uh, evidence you have that the reading was a verb and not the noun. All that gives me great confidence that God has not left us blind. People will say, oh, you can't know. You can know. Uh, you can absolutely know. The evidence is out there. You just have to be willing to look for it. Uh, and if it's they pierced my hands and feet, were David's hands ever pierced? So is he the speaker of the song? He's not. Uh, Jesus is. All right. Hope you have a great weekend. I'll see you on Monday.